So then, what do lobbyists normally do? Number one, they provide or providing access to public uh, policy makers. So the lobbyists, they provide access to public policy makers. So they can be viewed as specialist form of networking in the field of public policy making. And access can be characterized as point of linkage between separate groups of actors in the field. So the provision of access results in the ability of the groups for whom the lobbyists work to make it its case to a decision. Now, the police, uh, when you talk about lobbies, they usually provide access to po uh, public policy makers. Remember, we said that lobbies, these are people who have worked in the government before. So they, so they understand the government and how it works. Lobbyists, can be the former member of county assembly. A lobbyist can be the former mayor. A lobbyist can be uh, can be the <clears throat> can be the former member of parliament. A lobbyist can be maybe a person who worked in the Ministry of Land before. So in other words, they understand the government, its procedures. and some processes and so on and so forth. Therefore, lobbies, they provide access because they know these organizations will need access to the Ministry of Land. If they don't have somebody who understand matters concerning land, then they will have difficulties doing what? Accessing some information or accessing some very important persons in the Ministry of Land. So they provide access to uh, public policy makers. So access can be in two forms, either personal or an individual. For personal, uh, the principal and her lobbyist meets the decision maker. Remember the principal is the people that, uh, that, that, that are in charge of lobbyists that when lobbyists goes outside to lobby for the organization, they report to the principal. So we can have personal and individual uh, access whereby the lobbyist has made it possible for the principal and his lobbyist to go and meet a policy maker. Or we can have number two, a personal and electronic that we can do this, the lobbyists can uh, give you the contact of the key policy maker. He can give you the phone number or he can make it possible for you to meet, maybe Zoom meeting, or you can meet, uh, you can have what we call um, teleconferencing with that person that is a policy maker. So access can be of two, two types personal and individual, and we can also have personal and electronic access. So apart from providing access to public policy makers, lobbyists also, they make representation. They represent you. They represent the organization. Like for example, what we had, public participation. For, uh, before the finance bill was taken to parliament, we discussed and we voted, voted for either, we voted for either to be, okay, to be voted for, eh? you, you know what we mean. So because when you vote for something, you either vote accepting it or you vote rejecting it. So they make representation. They represent your company wherever they go. So once access has been gained, the presentation has to be made. And this is in line with the preferences of most hard lobbyists who do not want to be in the firing line of sharp questioning from the ministers and civil servants in policy areas where lobbyists are not experts. So that's why we are saying, as a lobbyist, you must be an expert. You must be an expert. 
you must understand if it's about, uh, let's say, for example, industry policies, you must be able to understand them. If it's about land policies, you must be able to understand all the policies of land. If it's about, say, for example, uh, legal policies that touches on the organization, you must be able to understand them. Because if you don't understand them and you're representing your company, it's going to be very difficult for you. You may end up losing. So one aspect of making representation or putting the case to decision maker is worth separate mention. Number three, what do lobbyists actually do? Lobbyists are what we call policy advisors. They advise the organization. When the organization wants to make this decision, we tell them, according to this, according to the government policy, you cannot do that. But you can do this to achieve your goal. So they are expert advisors. Many lobbyists are experts in their field. They are usually, they they are usually, or they have usually, or they, you will find that they usually worked for a business trade association. You'll find that some of them were in trade unions or pressure groups for a long time. So therefore being a lobbyist gives the post holder an overview of the organization he or she represents and policy knowledge is relatively easy to come by. So these people are advisors. They advise the organization. Say, for example, you have been, you have been um, found in a crisis. And uh, this crisis uh, requires you to go to court. Before you go to court and you have a lobbyist, the lobbyist will advise you what to do because he has been there before. Maybe he was a lawyer. Or maybe he was a former chief justice. So he understands things very well. So he will advise you, this is what you're supposed to do for this case to do, I mean, to, uh, to for this case to be in, uh, for this particular case to be in favor of the organization. So lobbies of poli they are policy advisors. Uh, we also continue with the policy uh, advisors. We are told that the policy advisors, they have privileged position or this privileged position is usually reinforced by the organization's chart. And lobbies are attached to their chairman or to the chairman of the organization. They are attached to MDs, the uh, managing directors, or they report directly to the executive committee just below the board. So generally, policy expert is more likely to be found in-house, in in-house lobbies than hired ones. So their expertise usually lies with the knowledge about the processes and personnel of policy making. So these people are experts. And you find that if they are expert, then most of the time they are usually in-house. Because if you go and again, look for uh, outside the lobbyist, before he advises you, he needs to understand the organization very well. Imagine you are going to look for a, an outside lobbyist or a hired lobbyist, and you're telling the hired lobbyist, I want you to represent my company because of ABCD. The hired lobbyist will take time trying to run your organization, trying to understand your structure, trying to understand your problem, and trying to understand you as an organization. While if you have an in-house lobbyist, an in-house lobbyist will not take time try to understand you. He already knows who you are. He already knows the structure of the organization. He already knows where the problem is coming from. He already knows how to, how to talk, uh, how to represent you. 
So policy lobbies are policy advisors. And the best policy advisor or uh, the best lobbyist is an in-house lobbyist, not an outside lobbyist. Outside lobbyists will cost you a lot of money and they may not represent your problem the way you want because they don't understand your organization very well. Number four, lobbyists, they are administrative support group leaders. Lobbies are administrative support group leaders. So what are we saying? That lobbies is often perceived as an activity involving interactions with high status individuals. Like for example, lobbies will interact with members of parliament. Lobbies will interact with, maybe for example, even the DCIs, the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, they will interact with people like the president, the vice president. They will interact with people like very high profiled people. But the majority of lobbying work is mundane and unglamorous. It is akin to background research where developing someone else case involves fact finding that often goes unrecognized. So in instances where research is not required, lobbies handle detailed administrative tasks necessary for meetings. So they make sure that there is meeting. They make sure that there are conferences and they make sure that they produce what we call public statements. So this includes monitoring parliamentary bills. We've talked about bills reviewing relevant documents from technical and professional opinion makers and managing papers from their principles. That is the work of the lobbyist. We continue. Lobbyists as administrative support group leaders. So lobbying can be categorized into backgrounder and foregrounder types. Eh? We have backgrounder and foregrounder types. Eh? So backgrounders, they act as unseen advisors. Like for example, you, will, you cannot tell who is an advisor of the president. Those ones are called backgrounders. They act as unseen advisors, passively monitoring documents, drafting materials for others, and giving policy control entirely to the principal. So they advise you. So when you are making decision, people will say, and this MD is very smart in decision making. Little do they know, or little did they know that there is a lobbyist who is advising you. So that lobbyist is called a backgrounder. So they provide advice on policy making, processes with minimal autonomy, and often remaining silent during meetings. They don't talk. They remain silent. They direct you. They give you everything. They, uh, they instruct you. They give you the necessary support that you need. But they will not talk and they will not show themselves. They will not, uh, they will not show themselves. They will actually not show people that I am the one who did this. Now, for grounders, on the other hand, they are visible advisors. And they act as... Uh, they act uh, and they are active spokespersons. You will see them speaking for, on behalf of the government. You will see them speaking on behalf of their groups. They are policy experts who monitor their group's environment, ready to formulate policies, represent clients in front of decision makers. You will see them uh, maybe, for example, the company has sent them, go and represent the company in decision making. So they are seen, they are known. And they engage in media campaigns. And for grounders are very comfortable with high level of public visibility and autonomy. They are very comfortable. They are not fearing people, even in campaigns. 
even when standing to represent their company, they don't fear people. It is the opposite of the background. Like sometimes we usually say behind the scene. Then there is this one, uh, another topic, lobbying styles. Eh? Let's look at lobbying styles. So lobbying relies on personal contact with senior public officials. You cannot do lobbying if you don't have contact with, with key, key policy makers. You cannot be a lobbyist if you don't have contact with key policy makers. If it is the media, you have contact of the media people. If it is government, you have contact of almost everyone in the government. So lobbying relies on personal contact with senior public officials in private meetings that are often not publicly listed. So these meetings involve high level of confidentiality, detailed discussions, and exchanges of information that may include agreements or conflicts. So this confidentiality and exclusivity, they help explain the tension between some lobbyists and other PR practitioners. So you cannot be a lobbyist if you don't have contacts of key policy makers in the government. Not only key policy makers in the government, but you also have contact of people from other organizations. For example, you are a university, you have contact of maybe a vice chancellor from this university, from that university and many other universities. Or if you are in school, you have contact of a certain principal, several principals within uh, the government, I mean, within, uh, within uh, that country or in that particular country. So lobbyists cannot work if they don't have contact with key, uh, with, if they have, don't have uh, contact with key uh, policy makers. What else? Lobbyists, they often emphasize public aspect. So when they go to represent the company, they will emphasize on public aspect. That's why I started by saying, for example, there is a piece of land that the government has uh, given an injunction. Court has given an injunction, of course, the government, the, the court in collaboration with the government, they have given an injunction that this piece of land is a uh, government land and it cannot be developed. Now you are a lobbyist. You want to go and lobby, talk to the government, to give you permission to develop that piece of land. Now, when you go to talk to the government, you will go with the public aspect in your mind. You're not going to say there that I am the one benefiting from that piece of land. You will go say there, you will go and say that this land, I'm going to develop a very big factory here. I'm going to employ uh, the community. I, and when I develop this particular factory or industry, I'm going to ensure that I pay my taxes on time so the government will receive good taxes. You tell them the advantages of that industry as far as the public is concerned, not as far as you are concerned, eh? as far as the public is concerned. That's why we are saying lobbyists often emphasizes the public aspect. Even during finance bill, they were talking about the public. They were not talking about the industry. They were saying that the public is going to suffer if this finance bill goes, is voted yes, or goes through. They were actually on the public aspect of public relations, uh, noting its reliance on media relations and mass demonstration outside parliament. This one we were able to see it yesterday. We were able to see a mass demonstration outside parliament, parliament before the bill was, was, uh, was uh, when the bill was being, when the finance bill was being read, eh? we saw demonstration outside parliament. 
So they view such public displays as a sign of weak persuasive power, believing that reporting to these tactics indicates a lack of influence. In their views, when the public demonstrations are necessary, work calls to PR practitioners. So those demonstrations you are seeing there, those young men you are seeing them demonstrating there, you'll find that it was the work of some public relations practitioners or some activist groups or some pressure groups to a higher go and demonstrate and tell the government that we don't need this bill. Yes, we continue. Lobbying sites. Eh? However, there are other lobbies who are comfortable with megaphone lobbying, particularly those working for external groups such as charities and advocacy organization. Now, these groups often lack easy access to decision makers, making public lobbying activities suitable tactic. Charities, even though they may be considered inside groups, have committed supporters nationwide who they want to engage and uh, be seen uh, by public, eh? by people. Eh? Public lobbying activities can thus be an effective strategy for these organizations. Public lobbying activities, when you involve the public in lobbying, can be very effective. What we saw yesterday. Let's look at background of background titles and reputation of lobbyists. A significant number of lobbyists were previously involved in government. So for you to be most of the people that uh, are lobbyist organizations find that they were previously involved in government. By involved in government as either research assistants, by involved in gov government as MPs, by involved in government as financial party workers, maybe they were civil servants, or of MPs, maybe they were civil. Uh, or maybe they were, uh, they were assistant secretaries to the MPs. The implication is that lobbyists are likely to be very familiar with policy processes. That's why we need a lobbyist who has been an ex-government worker. So they are familiar with policy processes and personal, and that their principles employ them because of this knowledge and their contact. So you are employed because you have been in the government before. And you have so many contacts for the government. Like you can ask, say, for example, a person who works in government, say, for example, Ministry of Water. If you ask him, he will tell you, I know some people from the Ministry of Land. He will tell you, I know some people from the Ministry of Defense. I know some few people in the Ministry of Gender and Children, and so on and so forth. So lobbies, any person who has worked in the government, most of the time you'll find that he has contact with key people in the government. So they are employed in an organization because of the knowledge that they have and also because they have contact of people who work in the government. The next point, we are saying this, the implication is that you could not lobby without knowing the policy making system. That is very true. You cannot be employed as a lobbyist and you don't know how policies are made in the government and how systems of the government work. And it's personal, it's personal first. So in-house lobbyists work under titles such as, I think we had looked at a few of them, public affairs, they work with titles such as government relations, they work as a title such as corporate relations, they work with titles such as parliamentary liaison, while hired lobbyists, they work for firms calling themselves public affairs consultant, 
communication specialist, PR consultant, political and regulatory advisors. You see the word uh, at the end of the title. Either it is expert, advisors, eh? consultant, those things. Those ones are external. That is where now you go and look for an external lobbyist. So lobbying can be viewed as a high line road which attracts to itself fear about a powerful particular interest being privileged over a public interest. So the resolution of this tension lies among other things in openness about government dealings with groups and these lobbyists. And in their accountability to electorate of elected judiciary and appointed public servants for their dealings and agreements with uh, groups and their lobbyists. So determining general effectiveness of lobbying is challenging because it depends on whether groups uh, achieve policy goals. The debate can focus on individual lobbyists assessing their personal effectiveness based on their employment state uh, success, the persuasiveness acknowledged by decision makers. Effective lobbies exhibit certain attributes. For you to be an effective lobbyist, you must have certain attributes. Uh, we are talking about they recognize lobbying as mutual activity that grants access in exchange of for expert information. They master their briefs and present them accordingly. And they possess a sense of timing in policy making changes. So for you to be a lobbyist, you must recognize lobbying as a mutual activity that grants access in exchange of expert information. That's number one. You must recognize that you are master uh, they, are, they they master their briefs. You must be able to master your briefs if and present them appealingly. And you must possess keen sense of timing in policy uh, making changes. In summary, determining the general effectiveness of lobbying is challenging. Determining the general effectiveness of lobbying is challenging. Why? Because it depends on whether groups are achieve policy goals. So the debate can focus on individual lobbyists assessing their personal effectiveness based on their employment success, their persuasiveness acknowledged by decision makers. So effective lobbyists exhibit certain attributes. Number one, recognize lobbying as a mutual activity, grants access or expert information one we have spoken, they master their briefs and present them appealingly, and they possess a keen sense of timing in policy making changes. Having said that, I think I have done the summary, and uh, that marks the end of uh, this particular presentation. Unless there is a question, I'll stop there. <laughs>